it was a weak handover that we got from the Wall Street and that is something which is reflecting in the Asian markets as well. Support for the Nifty comes in at the swing low, which is 23,893. 24,250 is where the Nifty is starting at. Pharma is, uh, uh, has done extremely well. To keep the policy repo rate unchanged at 6.5%. It was a fairly um, status quo policy in terms of rates, in terms of stands. The interesting reaction is coming in on the bank nifty. I think uh, uh, they're still trying to figure out whether this policy indeed was hawkish or not. Do you see any downward bias to our growth and inflation if things were indeed to turn out to be that the Fed has to do five cuts if there is that kind of a slowdown? Oh, you cannot uh, rush to a conclusion about uh, possibility of slowdown or possibility of a recession. There has been a sharp slide from the highs for the frontline indices. The Nifty down almost three quarters of a percent. Sharpest strategies, top market trends, unmatched perspectives. The Trading Day's most comprehensive roundup. Stay ahead with NSE Closing Bell. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswald Studios in Mumbai. Well, it's down. It's down about 150 odd points as we start the last hour of trade here on Closing Bell. We're coming to you from the CNBC TV 18 Motil Oswal Studios. I'm Prashant with you. My colleagues Reema and Surubi here in the studios. Nigel is joining in from the newsroom floor, guys. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. So the policy has come and gone, and I think uh, people are still wondering whether to call it uh, semi hawkish, fully hawkish, half hawkish. <laughs> but the event is over. <laughs> you know, sir, uh, in central bank speak, it's a hawkish hold. <laughs> huh? There, you got the perfect one. HH. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And by the way, it's interesting uh, that you talk about the RBA policy because the market made a high right after the policy. Uh, actually, it made the high, the day's highest point is at about 12.20 this morning. I mean, the RBA press conference started and it was sort of uh, beginning to take questions, etc. And that, I mean, the high point was uh, there. In any case, I mean, you've got a bit of a pullback uh, which is uh, happening. Uh, across the board. So, uh, as I said, and, and interestingly, technically speaking, uh, you know, we put out uh, this gap area for the Nifty. The graphics will come up on your screen. We put out this gap area for the Nifty, which is 24,350 to 24,686. That's a sharp sell-off that happened after, of course, the global uh, cut. Today, and that's basically the near-term hurdle, the important near-term hurdle which the market needs to take out. Guess what the high today is? 24,340. So you got to basically the upper end of this gap area uh, and then the market has basically turned around uh, from there. But that's broadly 24,350 to 24,686 is the level which the market needs to uh, take out in the near term. For the Nifty Bank also, it needs to take, I mean, there is a gap, smaller gap, which uh, with the levels we put out in the morning, uh, it is outperforming what the Nifty is doing. It is up while the Nifty is down. But the Nifty Bank has also given up gains from the highs. Mid-caps and small-cap indices are trading absolutely flat. But there is no dearth of stock-specific action which we will continue to touch upon and highlight. Reema. Uh, the Nifty is now below 24,150, down 150 points. And today we've even breached yesterday's intraday low which is 24,184. So it's not a great sign when that happens. The mid-cap index has sold off 400 points from the day's high and is now in the red. The small-cap index, too, is down close to about a quarter of a percent. And the advanced decline ratio has now moved in favor of the losing side. Again, all that slide has happened in the last uh, two hours or so. European markets are on the back foot. The CAC, DAX, and the FTSE frontline indices there down, you know, almost up to a percent. So the rebound fading. Uh, and IT is under severe pressure. The Nifty IT index is down 1.8 percent. The biggest sectoral drag today with names like LTI Mindtree, Infosys, HCL Tech. And, you know, some of these large cap names like LTI Mindtree, Wipro, these have sold off 15, 16 percent from their recent highs just about two weeks back. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, those are some stocks under pressure. The mid-cap uh, selling is uh, fairly pronounced. And some of the stocks are taking it on the chin right now. I mean, outsized reactions coming in. Look at Lemon Tree. You can argue that maybe it wasn't the, the best quarter for the company. The stock's down about uh, 9, 9.5% 9 as we're speaking. Um, you have, of course, Gokuldas Exports. That's in a big slump right from the morning. Again, weak numbers coming through. Uh, so, you know, and beyond this, in terms of the movers and shakers in the volume charts, a lot of money coming off the PSU pack once again. So, your RVNL, Sale, uh, Nalco, these are stocks, you know, power grid from the large cap screen, uh, NMDC, Gale. So, PSUs as a space, 
uh, there's a, there's a you know big cool off that seems to be underway. But having said that, I mean you still have the winners here and there. Uh, and uh, some of the names would include, let's say, a Bharat Forge, where the numbers came in, numbers look uh, fairly okay. Uh, you've got BSC that's still retaining that 8.5% gain. So short point is that the market is being very, very nuanced. And wherever there is a miss, uh, I mean, those stocks are not being spared, especially if they have had a very good run-up in the past. That seems to be the mood right now, very flat on the mid-cap index. Nigel. Well, that's right. You know, I'm just looking at a few themes uh, from the broader markets. It seems this renewable theme is really... Uh, uh, you know, playing uh, playing its part. You have Suzlon, that's locked in upper circuit. Remember, the markets are wobbly, but this one has done very, very well. In the recent past, it's moved very swiftly to that 73 rupee mark. So Suzlon is locked up 5%. You have Vare Renewable, that's another one that's up close to around 5%. Websol uh, Energy as well. So all these stocks, you know, just 5% circuit band, but all of them are doing well. So some of them should come up for you on the screen. And in terms of result reactions, take a look at MRF. The stock is flying away. It's at the high point of the day. And Bharat Forge as well, we'll get to chat with the management, I think, tomorrow. But that stock as well is now up close to around 4%. On the flip side, Olympic Pharma is the stock that initially reacted positively. But as we speak, it's corrected 5% from the high point of the day. The end-of-day chart actually will tell you the real story out there. Let's get in Mitesh. Hi, Mitesh. Uh, good afternoon and good to see you in. Well, we're down 130 points. Uh, we did see a big recovery when the RBI governor was addressing uh, the press. But, uh, you know, again, we're down 130 points. What's the line in the sand? If someone has a long position, where should their stop loss come in at? Yeah. So, Nigel, one, I think, you know, avoid long is what I've been suggesting and telling people to go short on rallies. I think Prashant was just highlighting the upper end of the uh, resistance levels first, the start of the gap area. I think if you look at that entire gap area, it's also got uh, two more things. Uh, retracement of the fall, which has happened from uh, uh, levels of 25,080 to about lows of 23,900. And also the intraday hourly and two hourly charts, there are moving averages there. So I think, uh, you know, getting past this gap might be a very difficult thing. And uh, overall, I think, you know, while we have been oversold and that's why we are getting these bounce backs, I think uh, if we don't capture the gap, then I think it's a very strong possibility that in the coming few days, we'll break below the levels of 23,900 and head towards 23,600, uh, 500 zone. So, my bias still remains the same. Sell uh, near the upper end of the range and uh, keep selling on bounces. Uh, on the stock side, I have a sell in a buy. Uh, Ramco Cement, I think, is uh, breaking down here. So sell with a stop at about uh, 819 and look for a target of roughly around 770. And Pedilite is a conditional buy. In fact, you know, if you look at the chart, uh, for the last many few days, it's trying to get past this level of 3200, 3205. I think it's trading right below that. 3185 is the price. So if it starts getting past 3200, buy with a stop at 3160 and look for a target of 3300 to begin with. We'll then look at higher levels as well. Thank you. We'll come back to you for more. For now, let's uh, talk about the stocks which are in the move at this hour. MRF is surging after beating street estimates. Sudarshan joins in with uh, his quick analysis. Sudarshan. So MRF has reported Q1 earnings and that those earnings were better than estimates and helped stock gain up to 5%, recording biggest single day gain in last two months. And now it's 7% away from the record high. Talking about the numbers, profit was down 3%, but it was sharply higher against our estimate of 434. Profit is coming to pace 563 crore. Revenue is up 12% year on year. EBITDA is up 2%. Margin is down 150 bips, but it's almost, uh, uh, it's, uh, almost 200 bips higher than the estimate of 14.6%. But going forward, what company has to track or like what market will be factoring is the increase in rubber prices that we have been seeing in the last few months. Just Kotem rubber price just in the last one month has increased almost 20%. So overall earnings were better than estimates, but going forward, we'll be tracking rubber price. Devain is also with us now on the show. Devain, it's been a mixed bag for, you know, tyre companies this time. So MRF numbers were good. But earlier when you had Apollo tyres or even JK tyres, they were a disappointing set of numbers. And now with the rubber price movement that Sudarshan highlighted, how would you approach tyre names and is there any stock that you like? Yeah, Rima, good afternoon. Well, I think the business and the tyre company remains as cyclical as it was ever before. And probably I think that's the challenge that one would have if one wants to give you this business on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Uh, the impact of raw material prices in some company vis-a-vis -vis the others I think is definitely reflected, including in MRF result, I think the margins have been uh, lower comparatively. Though I think in some of the product mix, I think they have ended up resulting into a better amount of volume-led growth in the company, as that is what my understanding is. 
So I think uh, one can analyze the result, but at this point of time, I think if one wants to get into any particular company within that particular space, no, we don't have that kind of conviction. We probably, I think, would stay with, I think, the other ancillaries which are not so cyclical vis-a-vis -vis the tire ancillary, which is, I think, largely cyclical because of the very nature of the business uh, due to the raw material prices and such. By the okay. Way, uh, that's uh, a take on MRF, uh, positive reaction coming in over there. Uh, the other stock that's reacted well to numbers is actually Bharat Forge. Uh, Q1 numbers came in just a while back. Sudarshan is joining in. Sudarshan, I think earlier you were pointing out, right, that maybe on the domestic CV side, things are not great. But I think defence and some of the other businesses really firing away. Yeah, defence is doing good as usual. But over, if you talk about the overall earnings, earnings were in line. But what has helped the stock to move higher was the commentary that came from Baba Kalyani and the company. Now, first talking about the numbers, profit was down 14%, but it was largely because of one-time loss of 146 crore that company has reported. Revenue was up 10%, EBITDA has increased 20%, and margin was up 200 bips year on year. Now, talking about the segments, defence revenue has increased 147% year on year. Largely because last year there is no base of the last year. That's the reason you are seeing an increase of 147%. Order book currently stands at 5,400 crore against 5,200 crore that company had as of March 2024. For India business, CV business remains soft and companies, it, it was because of domestic demand was tepid due to elections. Domestic PV's revenue was up 32%, industrial segment revenue increased 45%, and in the export segment, CV business was steady, revenue was up 3%. PV and industrial revenue have slipped 1%, 6% respectively. Debt position has also improved. Long-term debt has come down by 16%. It currently stands at 1,433 crore against 1,700 crore that company had as of March 2024. Now, talking about the commentary, Baba Kalyani says, expect continued positive momentum in Q2 and all the businesses will see improvement in operational parameters and about FY25 companies says, it will be a year of growth driven by defence and industrial casting business. It sees continued improvement in capacity utilisation of overseas business and turnaround of overseas business and margin improvement will aid the profitability that company is expected to see for FY25. Okay, thank you very much for that. You know, there's another stock which is reacting adversely to its Q1 numbers and that's RVNL. Pull up an RVNL, that stock is down close to about 7-8%. Uh, it's been one of the big movers. RVNL stock price year to date is up 200%. Now, weak numbers, revenues have fallen by nearly 26%. Revenues of 4,000 crore versus 5,500 crore. EBITDA margins have come down to 4.5%. Profits are down 35%. So that's a stock uh, where the mar there was no room for error and Q1 earnings appear to be disappointing. So the stock is under severe pressure. Devin, uh, you want to comment on Bharat Forge or RVNL? Well, I think both these companies, particularly Bharat Forge results, I think are good. Uh, if you normalize the impairment charges that they had in the subsidiary and add it into the profit, I think the numbers are uh, reasonably good. I think from a perspective of looking at the uh, overall business environment, they are actually, I think, scoring well with margin as well as, I think, the new order book. Uh, what we like most about is, I think, there are consistently higher amount of order inflow coming in from the defense segment. And also, I think the oil and gas segment, I think, which are up till now uh, having, I think, little issues, I think that has also started contributing well. So overall, the earnings are satisfactory, as I would call it as. But when you look at the valuations, I think the valuations have probably priced in everything at this point of time. Maybe the defense narrative is working so strong as a tailwind. As a result of which, I think their stock is quoting at around 70, 75 times price to earning. In my viewpoint, I think that's the risk I think that one takes in the current market. Because everything is well priced, everything is priced to perfection at this point of time. If at all, I think one wants to buy, it should be only in correction. That is what I believe. RVNL kind of a business definitely cannot be seen on a quarter to quarter basis, even though they may have the larger order to execute from railway side. But still, I think everything is in price. I think today is 70 times plus, I think, kind of a price earning ratio for this company as well. So nothing is cheap. I think this probably thinks all the possibilities are already factored into the price currently in both the companies. All right. Hi, Devin. Good afternoon. Devin, what do you like from the real estate stocks? You know, you have Godrej uh, Properties that's now under pressure. That's down close to around 3.5% or plenty of to and fro. You know, when there was a tinkering with the LTCG, that time some of them said it's positive. When that was changed and you had an option whether you want to go for the new or the old format, 
well, people still believe it will be positive. The real estate cycle is appears it's not yet finished. How do you play it? Yes, Nigel, good afternoon. Well, I guess I think the real estate cycle will remain positive. And if I'm a little bit more ambitious in putting this phrase across it, I think we are likely to see, I think, the decades of uh, a boom in the real estate business going forward in the country. Because we are transforming big time as a country, and that is where I think the real estate probably registering the maximum case. However, this business is not one quarter, one year business. I think this business should be seen over a period of time. Most of the developer companies, I think, are having reasonably good business model. But as I said, we are in some other case. I think everything seems to be built into the price today. This market is not cheap in many cases as I see it. So unless you get some meaningful price correction, or maybe I think you end up buying with the time correction, that would be the time when I think probably this becomes very uh, compelling to add into the portfolio. Otherwise, good business, but I think probably the price is a little bit an issue. They are expensive at this point. Okay, fair enough. So that's a call on some of the real estate stocks. By the way, I just want to point out uh, PCBL, Philips Carbon Black. Remember the stock uh, started, you know, pretty much going on a tear soon after Mr. Sanjeev Goenka in that interview with Shireen spoke about expansion and the, the path ahead for this one group company. Uh, the stocks are up almost, I think, 60-70% in the last uh, one year. A lot of that gain has happened in the last, uh, I think, fortnight or so since that interview happened. Let's pull that up. Yeah, that's a sharp spike uh, once the, he sort of outlined the growth roadmap for PCBL, getting into a lot of specialty products as well. Numbers which came in today, the EBITDA has jumped 70%. And the margin has expanded by about 110 basis points as well. So it's been a good show. So on that huge move, it's building on it today with this 4.5% kind of a, uh, of an improvement. Uh, Devin, I don't know, but it's, it's a, obviously a very old company. It's been around for a long time. Uh, I don't know if, it's, if it crossed your radar. Any thoughts here? Yeah, Surabhi, I think the fortunes are linked to the tire industry for sure. And I believe that I think given the kind of growth that we are seeing in this particular segment, Undoubtedly, I think you're likely to see the, the I think, higher growth continuing for carbon black business for sure. Um, the all, all point out here is that I think they are commodity driven activities. So frankly, I think at times the commodity prices could affect your margins. And that's what I think is not in your control as an investor sitting outside. So that's where probably I was making a point even in the entire company's investment case that one would prefer to buy into those ancillaries which are catering to the uh, OEMs because over there we have strong conviction. There where, uh, that is where probably I think you can possibly make more uh, recent investments systematically growing in your portfolio. Commodity driven businesses that don't give enough confidence to stay invested for long term. Right, uh, Devin, we leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure and uh, always great uh, chat uh, with you. Uh, well, 130 points down is what we have on the Nifty, 24,166. We're going to take a quick commercial break here. We're going to come back. More numbers are flashing at the bottom of the screen. This is AstraZeneca with its uh, first quarter earnings. Stay tuned. Coming back.
Welcome back. Uh, we have the management of Nazara now joining in. Nitish Mithersim is a joint MD and CEO at Nazara. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nitish, for joining us. Good afternoon, Prashant. Hey, congratulations. I mean, uh, you guys are on an acquisition spree. Uh, and well, one after the other, almost one every, I'm exaggerating, but almost one a week. Uh, so the latest one, uh, for our viewers, uh, let me just quickly outline uh, Nitesh, uh, which you've sort of uh, closed right now, is a UK-based gaming company. Uh, it's called uh, Fusebox, and you're paying 228 crores, all cash deal. Uh, tell us about this and uh, what this brings to you. Sure. So Prashant, uh, I have spoken earlier that the core gaming business is very attractive for us. And uh, the cash that we had, you know, built up over the last year with over 1,000 crores would be, uh, you know, deployed into acquisitions that we believe build our core gaming business, bring a lot of profitability growth to us, cash flow businesses, and also gaming IP. So this particular company uh, we found very attractive in terms of the valuation we paid, in terms of the financials. You know, they are growing well, and they build interactive story-based games based on popular television serials. So we think that is a very scalable model. We can really take it globally. And uh, that's why we've done this transaction. Uh, we're quite excited about it. Mm. Uh, can you tell us what is the, what's been the historical growth rate? Uh, we can see last year, I think revenues were about 116 crore for the one half of the year. Is that right? No. So no. annual no. revenues were... I'll, I'll just clarify that. Yeah. So calendar year 23, the company did approximately 87 crores in revenue with okay. approximately 12 crores or 11.7 crores in EBITDA. This year, in the first seven months, the company has done 116 crores of revenue uh, with an EBITDA run rate of 33 crores. It's high season for this company right now, but uh, even if you normalize it for the whole year, you would see a significant growth, uh, both in at least over 100% growth in revenue and, uh, you know, over 200% growth in EBITDA. So I think the company is on a fantastic trajectory. And I think combining with uh, Nazara's experience and network, uh, there's a lot more that we could achieve over here. Cash now left in the books. And are there more assets that you're eyeing right now? Yes, uh, most definitely. You know, we built, we spent uh, most of last year building, you know, patiently a very strong deal pipeline. We didn't want to be in a large hurry just because we were sitting on cash. And I think now we are in that execution mode where over the next few months we will deploy almost all of our cash. We see a lot of attractive opportunities and we are very much in execution mode right now. And what's the cash that's left? Sorry? What's the cash that is left after so, the string of acquisitions that you've already done? Uh, you know, we uh, we started off with a cash of uh, 1,000 crores at uh, Nazara and another four to 500 crores in our subsidiary companies. I think after this, we would still at a consolidated level have uh, close to 900 crores of cash. Wow. So more coming, more acquisitions coming. So uh, more coming, right? I'm right, uh, Nitesh. Hopefully so. Okay. I mean, you, have, you, you, you have a deal pipeline which you're already kind of uh, working on? Yes, definitely. So your revenues were 1140 crores last year. Yes. Uh, could you, you bought back your the stake you did not already own in Kidopia recently. There is this. Yes. Could you tell us what could the broad number look like this year and next year on the top line? Yeah, you know, Prashant, uh, it's quite dynamic right now. So we will not yet put out a guidance, a near-term guidance. But I think uh, we're very much on track for our FY27 guidance of our 300 crore EBITDA. And we'll try to improve on that for sure. Mm. A quick word, uh, your resolution plan to acquire Smash, which is in insolvency, has also been approved. How much are you, plan you know, according to the plan submitted by you uh, to the resolution professional, how much are you planning to pay uh, and uh, what are the revenues of Smash or the financials? Sure. So, you know, again, I've been advised by the lawyers to withhold that information till we publicly release it. But uh, we believe, uh, if you just zoom out, we see a lot of synergies in offline entertainment, especially with our esports vertical, uh, with the virtual reality that we are entering into. So we think that there will be a lot of online plus offline synergies. And that's why uh, we are really looking at uh, Smash or even other opportunities in that space uh, to build this hybrid uh, entertainment zones. All right, uh, Nitish, good speaking with you today. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting plans as always. Uh, stocks also doing really well, 5% higher. Thanks for uh, joining in today. So that's uh, Nazara.
with another acquisition on the gaming side this time, a UK-based company. Well, our next guest uh, on the show is uh, Pashupati Advani, uh, who is uh, with us. Uh, Pashupati, great to have you with us uh, on the show. You know, there's so much to discuss, but before we get started, in case you missed it and in case any of our viewers missed it, it's probably good to just uh, put on record what the RBI governor had to say. I mean, there was a lot of grilling, straight pointed questions on whether the RBI thinks that FNO is a problem, speculating in the market is a problem, and the fact that money is moving from bank deposits into the equity market, is that a problem? Is the RBI concerned? Hear out what the governor had to say. The mismatch or the divergence between bank deposits and bank credit growth the divergence will create may create let me put it this way may create asset liability or liquidity issues liquidity management issues so i am only flagging this issue that because of this divergence in growth of deposits vis-a-vis -vis growth of credit it can potentially result in a liquidity management uh, issue which the banks have to deal with. I am not by any chance suggesting that people should more deposits uh, in the banks, not go for equity market. It is left to the people to decide. It is left for the investor. It is left for the saver to decide where he wants to put the money. All that I am saying is that the banks need to focus on this, mindful of this, because potentially it can create some structural challenges with regard to liquidity management. And one way of dealing with this situation is that uh, the banks have the potential, you know, the huge network of their uh, branches which they need to capitalize and uh, raise their uh, deposit uh, levels if they have to, uh, you know, if they are uh, proposing to also sustain and support their credit growth. Okay, so that was the governor pretty much uh you know, putting it out as clearly as he can. So, Pashupati, let's start there, right? Uh, banking is the one space in the market. Everyone's uh, waiting for it to fire up. And yet, right from not giving out too many personal loans to now chasing deposits and chasing the fact that money is moving to the equity markets, bankers, I think, have a lot on their hands. What do you make of these comments? And overall, I mean, would you be a buyer of uh, some of the frontline banks at this point? There's also one more thing that you haven't mentioned, which I, I read in the fine print in one of the newspapers recently, which is that fintech companies have been asked to marry with banks to try and make sure that their systems match so that uh, their lending is done on the same kind of basis as, as uh, bank lending, which I think is a good thing if it can be executed. Because according to me, it's the fintechs that are just uh, giving loans on, you know, just basically on computers, I can call them. And then they're taking money from the banks by refinancing. So when those computer loans don't actually happen, uh, or there's any kind of bad loans on that, then it'll obviously come and bite the banks, but later. Um, definitely, banking sector is a proxy for growth in India. And since we all feel that uh, growth is going to go up, uh, the banks are a place to be. Uh, the frontline private banks are doing extremely well now again. And of course, the PSU banks have done well, come off, and then we'll probably uh, follow the frontline private banks, um, you know, the way they always have. And money is coming into the index and uh, the banking and financials are a good solid chunk of it. I don't know exactly what it is. It's like 25, more than 25 percent, I think. So, so you're sounding unfazed. All the concerns, including the one that you described. And yes, there was a mention of fintechs as well and probably sort of uh, looking at that more closely. But you, you're unfazed. You'd still put money in banks right now. Yeah, I, I think the frontline banks are OK. I just think that the problems are with the fintechs. Now, fintechs also have equity. If the fintech blows up, hey, you know, maybe there's enough money there, maybe there isn't. We don't know yet. And so far, they're not not uh, blowing up at all, but uh, they could. The other thing is that, you know, uh, all the gold loan people have been uh, got increase in gold loans. Today, gold is at 2,400 US uh, per ounce. Um, you know, if it came down to 1,500, it would be uh, crazy. But I think that uh, um, at 2400, everyone's comfortable and does, don't look like any kind of, um, you know, loan losses are going to come from that sector. But who knows? I mean, you know, we'll see. I hope gold doesn't drop because I'm a gold bug. So, you know, that's that's me. Hi, Mr. Advani. Good afternoon. Nigel on this side and good to see you in as always. I, you know, I recall we chatted, I think, about ABB, uh, Siemens as well as Zomato. I think you had some positions in those. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, you know, you were deliberating whether or not you should be building onto those positions. What's the view well, right now? They have done very well. 
Well, actually, you know, the um, ABB Siemens, that sector is uh, very good simply because uh, the government is spending and the government is continuing to, to spend more and more in infrastructure. And these are the guys who are the top line foreign people who are benefiting from it. They, they don't really have too many Indian competitors. Uh, but, you know, solid money will come from abroad. Money will go into those those stocks. They have come off a little bit simply because, um, you know, there has been some FBI selling. So I think that that's probably put some pressure on some of these frontline names. Uh, regarding Zomato, I've actually not had a position in Zomato, Nigel. Sorry, I wish I had. Um, but at the same time, I think Swiggy is looking to do another uh, uh, round raise in the private market. So people are saying, would you rather buy Swiggy at say one third less than Zomato or maybe half the price of Zomato because Zomato has got, you know, out there. And uh, the other thing is that there was this article about Zomato having made money from bonds rather than from food delivery. So that's an interesting uh, spin. So let's see what happens. Absolutely. But they're both here to stay. But they're both here <laughs> to stay. The point that you were making sort of be about uh, banks, right? I mean, mm. uh, flows going into stock markets and not mm. uh, bank deposits. If you talk to mutual fund managers, right, mm. they'll tell you that anything you buy or sell, Money is going back into the banking into the system. Bank. Ultimately, yeah. the right? uh, you know, if I'm buying so the stock, the, the seller. But there is a catch there, which they don't. The catch is the money actually goes to the goes to your current account, mm. which is linked to your uh, uh, you know whatever DMAT account or trading account, etc. Right. Mm. But the problem is slightly longer tenure yeah. uh, deposits, uh, you know, FTS and term deposits, and those those are the ones yeah. which are actually uh, suffering. Yeah. So. Uh, the point is correct, but there is also that, uh, no, you know, nuance depending on which side of the fence you are uh, at. But I think we've heard it from pretty much everyone. Uh, I think the Sevi, Sevi uh, chief has spoken about it. Finance minister is, I don't know if she's alluded to this one, but of course now we've heard it from the RBI governor as well. So this, there's, I think, a fair bit of focus on this. Uh, 150 points lower right now. 24,150 is where uh, we are at. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's looking a little uh, down, uh, but not out really. Just a quick word on uh, on on uh, uh, Pashupati High afternoon uh, on LIC. I think the numbers are today or tomorrow. Uh, stocks at about 1140-ish. Uh, insurance, life insurance company. Insurance companies generally have done quite well this year, uh, relative to other sectors. Uh, do you like this one? Do you own it? Yeah. So I. I uh... Like the stock, I think that uh, my guess, my guess is the government will probably let it float up to 1200, 1250, and then do an FPO because they really need to get more stock into the market. It is the big jumbo of the industry, and they've hardly sold a few percentage of it. Uh, they'll also get some money in if they do the, if they do that. Um, I also was listening to a radio station, and they're saying they're looking for agents. So that means more agents, and and it's becoming more fashionable to get life insurance, and uh, more and more people are earning, and so you know it's it's probably a good place to be. And life in LIC is definitely the people the people that sell the most number of policies. Um, plus, I guess they uh, secretly advertise on your channel as well. We keep seeing flashes of um, LIC whenever. whenever uh, we look at the screen, but you know, anyway, I'm, I, I mean, I'm, no, sorry, go ahead. No, Pashupati, I, I'm just saying that I'm glad you also mentioned TV because I haven't heard that in a while that you were listening to a radio station and that's where you picked up the ad. So, uh, on a side note, but you're saying you also saw it on television, but interesting, at least someone listens to the radio now. No, go ahead. No, ra radio <laughs> is for uh, in, uh, calling for agents, okay? TV is the oh. LIC selling, they're even advertising on your channel, so you're getting a fact check from them, I'm sure. So they're taking banners and stuff, so that's good. But I think the government will do an FPO in LIC. I don't know whether it'll happen at you know 1250 or 1300, and then they'll give the public at six to ten percent discount, and uh, people will more people will be buying into the long-term story of insurance in India, which I think would be a good thing. Pashupati, what about Ola? Ola Electric list tomorrow. Uh, did you participate uh, oh. in? Did you subscribe? No. No, actually, I, I'm a great believer that, you know, you let an IPO come. Uh, you look at it uh, six months to a year later. If you look at last year's IPOs, most of them are at or below the issue price. There are three or four of them that are up. And that's the time to decide whether you want to take in a position. Uh, we, we even saw it in things like Zomato and Paytm, where they actually came way below um, their, their offer price. And, you know, so, so you had the chance to do it. And uh, so I kind of look at IPOs in that way. And the other thing is, you know, I'm not... A, I'm, Fortunately, not a small investor, so investing one two lakhs is uh, um, kind of painful. And uh, the larger institutions, the larger amounts, the allocation is kind of painful. So I just wait for the for the dust to settle, if you know what I mean. But so Swiggy is going to be the only exception, right? That's where you're willing to go in uh, pre-IPO because you miss Zomato. Well, 
Swiggy's trading a lot cheaper in valuation terms to Zomato. That at least is what's being offered. So let's see what happens. I mean, there are other there are other pipes also like NSC. Like you know, there's a lot out there. So you know, you can always have those choices to put away. And we are going to put out a piece on uh, capital marketplace, BAC, uh, uh, with Vamakshi in just a bit. Uh, BAC is doing very well. NSC, of course, people are waiting. You're waiting uh, for when the listing happens, hopefully next year. Uh, but who knows? Uh, but, uh, you know, numbers are looking very, very strong for all these companies. Uh, thank you very much, Pashupati, for joining us. Great conversation, as always. Page Industries numbers are at the bottom of the screen. And I also saw for a fleeting bit, Shilpa Medicare numbers. Uh, for the quarter, some 14 crores compared to about a crore and a half. Uh, stock sharp, rallied very sharply yesterday, and I think it is starting to move now as well. Look at the margin improvement, 25% versus 18.5%, uh, and uh, yeah, it's starting to move up a little bit, uh, 1%, 713 on uh, that one. There you go, the profit 14.1 versus 1.2. Uh, so what a 13x jump on a year-on-year -year basis. Well, we'll take a quick commercial break here. We are back. We get you what's happening in dealing rooms on a D Street Chatter. Nimesh gets us that. We'll uh, get you some short-term trading ideas as well. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Well, in the last few minutes, actually, tech has come in for some further selling pressure, which has put uh, the Nifty a little bit under pressure. And that's why we're down to around the 24,100-odd mark. We're headed to the low point of the day. Infosys, that's the one that's uh, dragging a little bit. I think just pull up the intraday chart of HDFC Bank as well. That was holding well. Now, that's more or less stable with a gain of a percent or thereabouts. But let's get an insight into dealing room chatter. Nimesh joins us to fill us in. Well, Nimesh, trade the market's all over the place, right? We waited for the RBI queue. Then when the RBI governor was addressing the press, we went to the high point of the day. But now we're a little bit lower again. Yeah, in fact, you know, it's been a relatively quiet day of yeah. trade. Uh, the volumes are on the lower side, though the FIs continue to be on the sell side. So that's the overall feedback. But again, RBI policy was a status quo. There was no big surprise in the policy as well. From a flow perspective, while the Nifty Bank is marginal in the green, there is supply coming in the banks, and I've been saying this for the last many days, that there is supply from the larger FIs and institutions into the bank stocks. Even in today's trade, PSU banks, the private bank stocks, all are seeing some sort of selling pressure there. So that's one space where there is supply. Uh, the other space is the, the cash stocks. You know, a lot of the mid-cap, uh, small mid-cap cash stocks is seeing some sort of selling pressure now. So it looks like there is a bit of profit booking in the cash names as well from the larger institutions, both FIs as well as GIs. You also look at the, look, uh, you know, look at the PSUs, like not only the PSU banks, but across the PSU stocks, there is a bit of profit booking now, and all the stocks have shaved off 15, 20% from mm. the high. So there is a bit of churn happening, and now a bit of selling as well, in not only in cash stocks, but in the PSU cash stocks as well. Okay, all right. Let's get into some individual uh, names then, Nimesh. Uh, what are you picking up? So, uh, as I spoke, well, I spoke about, you know, uh, supply in the bank names. Indescent in Bank stands out. There was selling pressure in the, in the morning trade in Indescent Bank, but the stock is recovered. Looks like the selling pressure from a leading long only fund is largely over. And uh, interestingly, there is a Morgan Stanley tactical buy as well. They believe that the stock can rebound after the recent uh, underperformance. So that's the first name. The second name is Cummins. Uh, for, uh, you know, since the since the quarter one numbers as well as commentary, there has been a, there has been an aggressive buying coming in. So again, in today's trade, there are there are there is delivery based buying in Cummins, and that's why that that stock also stands out. The, the third is a couple of cash stocks which I spoke about. There is selling pressure. Uh, Sham Metallics and Muthut Microfinance both stands out. Hardly you see you know these kind of names in the institutional desk. And today, in both these names, there is selling pressure. Though small, but there is delivery based selling in both these names today. And the last is Lawrence Labs. Within the pharma names, this is one stock, despite poor numbers, has, has relatively outperformed. Largely on back of buy flows. I understand some long only funds are quite active buyers as well. And hence, uh, you know, Lawrence stands out purely on back of buying interest from larger FIs. All right, uh, got that. Thanks very much, Mitesh. So that's all the buzz from the dealing rooms today. Uh, let's go across to Mitesh again, see what final trades we can work with. Mitesh, so it's, uh, yeah, we haven't had a day of gains. What would your advice be now on the index and any final individual stock calls? No, I think index, that view of $7 remain, and I think my view also is that eventually we'll break 23900 and head lower. Uh, but for the timing, I have two STVT calls. Bajaj, Finso, I think it's negative. So keep a stop at about 1555, look for targets of 1520 or lower. And Berger Paints is another one. In fact, both Berger and Asian have collected today. So Berger Paints is an STVT with a stop at about 523 and uh, 523 half and a target of 509. Okay, uh, Mitesh, uh, thank you for that. Coming back to you for more uh, as we uh, go along. But I uh, just want to get you this uh, sort of uh, special commentary from the insurance sector. Murugupa Group Company, Chola MS General Insurance, reported uh, gross written premium of 1945 crores in the first quarter. Uh, CBC TV 18's Jude Sanit spoke with managing director there, V. Surya Narayanan, who expects the company to grow at 17% this year, which will be higher than what they say is going to be the industry average at about 14%. He also highlighted uh, the uh, sort of uh, issue of 18% uh, sort of GST on health insurance and companies' growth and profitability, the roadmap there. Listen in. Our intent is to grow at least at 1.25x of industry growth, mm -hmm. which if industry grows at about 14%, then we should be growing at about 17-18%. I would leave you to do the math. All right. Profits have also been rather healthy, especially in the last couple of fiscals. What do you expect on that front? Do you expect to grow margins? Uh, what is the projection as far as profitability is concerned? So actually, the profitability has grown on two fronts. Uh, one is our underwriting losses mm -hmm. over the last couple of years have been shrinking. Mm -hmm. Plus, the growth in business has meant that uh, the investment corpus has been on the rise. Mm -hmm. We have also been in a favorable interest rate cycle. Remember that all insurance companies are investors. They don't borrow from the market and a high interest rate regime means uh, they earn more on investment income. So this has also helped us. Uh, so together, I think this has helped us uh, shore up our uh, profit line. 
and uh, improve our returns to investors. And how do you see this path to profitability continuing as the years roll by? See, the point is uh, interest rate cycles will uh, make the investment income, at least the debt income, uh, wobble mm -hmm. uh, based on the fluctuations. We have also been stepping up our uh, positions in equity investments, which should provide the counterweight as interest rate uh, cycles change. And uh, we do expect that our underwriting results uh, should uh, improve as we go along and our combined ratios uh, to get below 105 over a period of time. Mm -hmm. This means that uh, we are on the right track. As at the quarter end, 63% uh, of our total business is from motor. Mm -hmm. It used to be as high as about 71. Mm -hmm. While we will see absolute growth in the motor uh, premium, but as a, our own bid to diversify our business, we would like, if this settles somewhere around 58 to 60 over the immediate term, mm -hmm. but we will stay focused. It's a lifeline on the main product category. We will continue to grow well. Many of these changes only mean that the confidence of the customer in insurers and uh, in health insurance is poised to improve with many of these regulatory changes. Uh, some other changes like constitution of a uh, claims review committee, mm -hmm. then um, the uh, timelines for cashless approvals, right. discharge approvals, all these I think augur well for uh, improving the customer confidence in insurance. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly would like to grow faster in uh, health insurance mm -hmm. and from the present level of about 15%, we would like to take it up to at least 20% of our total business composition. Right, but of course, even as we speak about health, there's a whole debate raging on over you know, the GST imposed on health insurance itself with the many voices calling for it to be completely abolished, 18%. Uh, even Nitin Gadkari himself, right now, Finance Minister Masita Raman. Can I just get you on your take with regard to taxing the uncertainties on health and life and thereon? Uh, surely something that you feel the government can work around? Look at it this way, if it can help the customer to buy a larger quantum of health insurance, it does uh, certainly help him. So uh, if that money paid on GST for that 18% could be used to uh, position and buy for a higher level of cover, mm -hmm. I'm sure it will help the Indian citizens uh, in a large way. All right, let's uh, take uh, count of the markets. Then we have moved actually to the low point of the day. And I think a couple of stocks, NTPC has suddenly seen a bit of a downtake, so that should come up for you. GSW Steel as well has slipped a little bit, and ONGC. So this are, these are the top losers actually on the Nifty, all of them moving low, and explains why the Nifty is now down 185 points. But let's talk about a couple of stocks that are doing well from the broader markets. ITD Cementation, the numbers look quite good. And the street rate spy to see who exactly will pick up the promoter stake. Vivek joins us to fill us in with more details. Vivek? Well, that's right. You know, first, let's have a look at the numbers themselves. Quite a strong set of numbers. Remember, most of the EPC player, most of the infra players actually have seen a subdued quarter, both in terms of execution and also in terms of order inflow activity. In that sense, you know, IT cementation in that context seems to have done very well. Uh, so revenues have almost 30% indicating strong execution, even in this subdued quarter, coming in close to the 2,381 crore mark. EBITDA higher by 37%, margins too very strong, almost 50 basis points higher on a year-on-year -year basis. On the back of that, profitability higher by 92%, almost doubling. Now, at the end of Q1 FY25, the order book stood at a little over 18,500 crore, uh, which are, indicates, you know, it's actually been a little bit softer compared to the end of Q4. So, order inflow in this particular quarter was just around 1,053 crore. Now, why are we saying that's quite soft? Given the fact that the company at the end of FY24 actually said that they're targeting order order inflows of close to 8,000 to 10,000 crore. So, you know, a significant portion of order inflow activity, the company will have to recoup from Q2 onwards. Now, talking about uh, what is it that the management has guided in terms of revenue growth, a 20% plus revenue growth guidance and an EBITDA margin of close to 10% well on track at the end of Q1 to meet the revenue guidance, uh, uh, given the fact that they've done almost a 30% top line. EBITDA margin, 10%, they're still a little bit away from that, so it'll be interesting to see whether the company can reach that. But more importantly, remember, you know, the parent, that is ITD, has already said that they're looking to divest their entire slightly over 40% stake in the company. All eyes will be on, you know, who will be the eventual buyer of that particular stake, and more importantly, at what price does this particular deal actually uh, fructify? Thank you very much for that. Let's get to Bombay Stock Exchange. Now, BSC has been one big mover on the back of strong numbers, 8.5% uh, rally on the stock. Vamakshi now joins in for BSC. And how the numbers compare with what we know from NSC? 
Well, absolutely. Both of these exchanges reported their numbers yesterday. Uh, BSC's uh, revenue on a much smaller base grew by almost 24% sequentially. NSC, however, witnessed a degrowth of 2.5%. Uh, but on an operational front, uh, both the companies have performed really well. NSC, of course, has a higher EBITDA margin as compared to BSC, given its operating leverage. Uh, but the improvement in margin for BSC was much higher. In fact, uh, improvement in uh, margin for NSC was largely, uh, largely driven by lower regulatory fees, which was down nearly 11% and other expenses, while the sharp jump in BSC could be owed to uh, 170 crore provision that was created uh, for regulatory fees owed to SEBI. Resultantly, BSC margin stood at 46.73%, and NSE margin stood at 868.9%. Uh, as a result, when we look at the net profit, uh, the jump in uh, for BSC is much higher as compared to NSE. BSC net profit saw a sequential jump of almost one and a half times, while NSE uh, net profit was up nearly 3.2%. As far as market share is concerned, NSE of course continues to dominate but it has lost out on market share in the equity option segment. BSC on the other hand continues to gain market share in the derivative segment but the momentum for stock futures and options that were launched in July 2024 is still at a very nascent stage so we will have to watch out to uh, watch out for uh, how this exactly pans out for BSC. That said, there is definitely a potential risk and that is mainly on account of uncertainty on the eventual FNO regulation that will be announced by the government, uh, by uh, SEBI rather. We, uh, let's also look at the valuation picture. Uh, sources suggest that NSC shares in the unlisted market trade at around 5,200. Uh, given uh, the uh, uh, price at which BSC currently trades, uh, the P multiple for B BSC stands at nearly 34 times, while that for NSC stands at nearly 25 times. If NSC, say, were to trade at uh, the current multiples of BSC, the price would be pegged at almost 7,000 rupees per share. And if it is a little higher, given that NSE, of course, is a dominant uh, uh, player uh, in terms of volumes as well as market share, uh, the uh, price could, uh, at, uh, at a multiple of 45 times, could actually be at around 9,300. That said, uh, this time around, it is BSE that is definitely shining, shining brighter than NSE as far as the Q1 numbers are concerned. Mm. Okay, all right. Uh, you know, there was a, uh, the, thank you very much. There was a call as well mm -hmm. uh, on the uh, after the NSE results, and mm. uh, the NSE management has said that if the derivative... Uh, the rules are implemented in the current form. Mm. Uh, they didn't put a number to this. It was significant impact on volumes, mm. market volumes. Uh, uh, all the so expiries, one, one a day. That yeah, we have what is being the proposed week. in the consultation yeah. paper? If yeah. it is uh, implemented in that way, uh, there will be significant uh, uh, impact. Uh, so, I mean, if, you know, that's of course for the overall market, both will be impacted. But interesting sort of takeaways there. Well, Makshi, thank you very much for that. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We are back with more on the other side. Uh, we'll have Amrish Baliga. Uh, in just a bit. Stay tuned.
Well, it appears the final tick of the day is going to be the day's low. For uh, On the positive side, you'll say at least we defended that crucial mark of 24,050. That was the crucial uh, support level for today. But let's get in, Ambrish. Ambrish, it's a stock-specific market, so I'm sure you have an idea for us. Fill us in. Which one is it? Yeah, Nigel, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my pick today is a BEL. Uh, it's into aerospace and defense electronics, as everyone knows. Primary provider of uh, radar communication and electronic warfare technology to Indian Defense Forces. And among the civilian products, it makes electronic voting machines. Other focus areas are civil av aviation, met metro systems and railways. And they are also expecting a decently large order for Kavach. And uh, they have nine manufacturing units along with four research facilities. R&D spend is a decent 8% of revenue. And uh, they've done about 650 crores uh, of CAPEX last year, which is FI24, planned about 800 crores this year for developing new, I mean, five, five new factories. Uh, uh, order book position is excellent, about 76,000 crores. Uh, and with the rising defense spend across the globe, BL, I think, should be one of the prime uh, beneficiaries of this. Uh, recently, uh, I mean, we had the Q, uh, Q1 earnings. Uh, EBITDA growth was about 40% YNY. PAT improved about 46% YNY. So expecting an EPS of about 8 for FI26, my target is about 360, which is about a 20% return from here. Mm. What about ITD Cementations? Very strong numbers. The stock has been a big outperformer. I think it's up 90% this year. But there is that overhang of the promoter's stake. Uh, the Thailand promoter, which holds, is you know, close to about 40% stake. Um, where do you stand on ITD? Well, ITD, I mean, uh, clearly looking at the sort of intra projects which are happening, I mean, you can't uh, really uh, be bearish on uh, ITD. You need to be bullish on this. But yes, the, I think the overhang of uh, the promoter stake sale is there. And uh, I mean, I think as and when that happens, I think that could be an opportunity to buy at those lower levels because uh, I mean, typically these uh, stake sales happen at uh, a discount. I mean, you know, uh, India cement could have been a different issue, thing altogether. But generally, what we have seen is it happens at a small discount. Mm. And um, would you recommend buying BSC in the public market or NSC if you had a choice to buy it in the private market? Uh, I mean, uh, see, the earnings have been extremely good. It's, it was a positive surprise. But then I think the overhang of uh, the FNO, uh, possibly volumes coming down, I think uh, that's going to affect NSE much more than BSE. Uh, but then still, I think it will be, still be a bit negative for BSE. So at these levels, after this move which we have seen, uh, I mean, in the last, like, last two days, I think I would be a bit uh, cautious at this point of time. I'll not really add on. I'll possibly hold on. Okay, so that's uh, on BSC. Uh, just to talk about some of the uh, uh, the other major earnings, ITD cementation up about 11, 11.5%. There is PCBL, we've discussed that. Bharat Forge numbers are fairly well received. Uh, anything that stands out for you, Amrish, last one or two sessions? Uh, any earnings star for you? Uh, see, I mean, uh, like, like, like Bharat Forge, yes, I mean, uh, uh, like the numbers were okay, but I think the bigger news is, uh, uh, I mean, their fundraise, uh, and uh, that, I mean, that was announced, so I think that's a positive for Bharat Forge going ahead. So, in case, uh, I mean, we see a correction in Bharat Forge because of the markets, then I think it's a, it's a good buy. I mean, in case it comes to levels of about uh, 475, I mean, 1475, 1480, I think it's a good buy at those levels. Okay, thank you, Ambarish, uh, for joining in. It's going to be a disappointing session, a close below 24,100, 200 points gone on the Nifty. The Sensex down, close to about 650 points. The mid-cap index also ending in the red with an advanced decline ratio firmly in favor of the losing side. Two stocks in the green for three in the red. In terms of uh, sectoral action, IT takes the biggest hit today. The Nifty IT index down nearly 2%. But even uh, other sectors like the CPSC index, for instance, under pressure, metals down in trade. So largely global facing stocks and sectors weak um, in terms of stock specific action. It's LTI Mine Tree, the biggest drag on the Nifty, 4.5%. You had cuts in Grassim, Asian Pains, Apollo Hospitals. On the way up, uh, Life Insurance did well, HDFC Life, SBI Life. And then there is that Tata Motors with a gain of 1.5%. Well, disappointing for the mid-caps as well. The index has fallen not as much as the large-cap space, but still down about four-tenths of a percent on the, uh, the mid-cap index. Talking about the losers today, there were some of the newsmakers, very sharp result reactions coming in on the likes of Gokuldas Exports, Balaji Amin's, Lemon Tree Hotels. These are stocks down between 5 and 10%, depending on which one you're picking up. Throw in a GMM Fodler as well. 
some of the stocks that were getting very excited because of a possible Bharat Net tender, they saw profit taking today. Tejas and Sterlite Technologies were on the way down. Godrej Consumer, it's been a bit of an uninspiring quarter. The management commentary kind of curtailed the damage to an extent, but still the stock is ending about 3% lower. Dr. Lal is also going down with about a 2% uh, drop. What else didn't work today was the PSU space. There's been a lot of profit taking. RVNL also numbers are, you know, lower, uh, fall top line uh, onwards. So about 5% lower on that stock. Nalco, Hoodco, Sale, Gale, NMDC, DHEL, a whole, whole list. Uh, PSU is not such a hot space today. Mm, absolutely. And, uh, you know, 300 up yesterday, to, uh, 200 down today. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a <clears throat> bit of a disappointing day overall. Uh, I mean, at the last I checked, I think US futures were higher. I mean, I think S&P 500 futures were uh, slightly, I mean, I think flat. No, slightly lower. Actually, I just lower. checked, Prashant. Now, they've turned lower. The flat line to marginally lower. Yeah. So, let's see. A uh, little tentative for the time being. Uh, even CAC is down nearly 1.5%. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, global uh, still looking a little uh, tough. Later today, of course, the initial jobless claims data is, is assumes, I mean, usually we sometimes no, don't even talk about it, but assumes important because of the growth scare in the U.S. Uh, so let's uh, keep an eye out on that one. It's a wrap on this edition, a closing bell from all of us here. Goodbye, thanks for staying with us. Markets Forward will pick up on all the action in just a bit.